Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, February 5th, 2022. It's been another great week of shows and topics and guests. And we kicked off the week with a look at the potential for retirement legislation before the November midterms. Let's take a look. Uh, right now, it is not front and center because this is an election year. And a lot of the decisions being made is, you know, they're looking back and looking forward and the midterms are just, you know, at the end of the year. But having said that, uh, I agree with you. It's one of the few policy areas where there is bipartisan agreement. Uh, but the timing might be a little difficult because uh, Biden's tax and spending package, which passed the House, it has stalled in the Senate. Now, there are efforts to revive it, break it into parts, but we are being told that the part that has the best chance of moving soon is the climate, climate policies and maybe some healthcare uh, policy, not so much retirement. Well, so I'll first talk about uh, ranking name member, Ways and Means ranking member Kevin Brady. He's a Republican yeah. from Texas, uh, formerly chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. This is his last year in Congress. Uh, he's planning to retire after this current term. So, you know, he, in chatting with him, you know, he has been talking to Chairman Neal, Richie Neal, Ways and Means Chairman, and ways to move this Secure 2.0 forward. Uh, he wants it done. Now, that depends on what Congress is able to do with this build back better package. Now, you know, there are some retirement provisions that were in the build back better package passed by the house. Now, if that gets completely taken out, there might be a chance to do a retirement bill uh, sometime this year, maybe even after the midterms, which is called a late lame duck, uh, you know, period where, you know, there is more bipartisanship. So there is a chance of doing that. Uh, Richie Neal's office told me that, you know, they they feel good that, you know, this is a chance to work together and, you know, pass what's called a secure two point. Yes. And again, uh, Portman and uh, Card in the two senators who have worked previously on retirement proposal proposals, they could be the driving force uh, for to, you know, push this bill in the Senate. Again, Portman is retiring well liked by both sides, uh, you know, so. There's a chance there, but you know Ben Cardin, he's also focused on reforms to the IRS. He's been talking about that, you know, whenever I chat with him. So there are other things on their minds, especially the Democrats, because you know this year could be their last chance to do like a big legislative package. So they're focused on that. Now I am not sure how these building blocks will be arranged and what gets into the first bill that will be a democratic bill. And, you know, depending on that, you know, there are various things that get dropped out from retirement provisions that could make its way into the bill. I mean, uh, there are others, you know, who in the Senate, like, you know, Michael Bennett, uh, who will, you know, they have talked about retirement proposals, uh, you know, helping people who do not or cannot save for retirement, help them save for retirement. And it's been tougher to buy and rent real estate. We discussed it this week. Let's take a look. Yeah, I keep looking at the numbers every month and it is not getting any better uh, on the rental or the buying side. Uh, most recent numbers from the National Association of Realtors, uh, really good uh, good year for sales overall in 2021. Um, you know, increase of 8.5% sales, highest annual level since 20, uh, 2006. I don't think we're going to see that again. And partly that's because the inventory level at this point is at 910,000, which is uh, about 
1.8 months of inventory, the lowest level since 1999. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on, on the market. Uh, median price for existing homes is 358,000. There's a little talk of maybe we're going to see a slower in increase in prices uh, this year, partly because of interest rates rising. But really, the supply demand factor just doesn't seem to be going away. There's, I don't know why we can't seem to get people to list their homes for sale and we can't <laughs> build homes fast enough to keep up with the demand. Yeah, that's absolutely a factor. That's one of the reasons that that I buying was supposed to sort of eliminate some of that by offering people sort of a hassle free way to, to sell their houses. Doesn't quite seem to have been working out as as well as uh, certain companies thought it would. Um, one of the other things that some of these companies are doing is they're offering people uh, basically something that allows them to make a cash offer on another home because part of the problem here is it's so competitive. Homes are selling sight unseen. Bidding wars are still very common, so it's hard to find that other home to move into. People like cash offers. People <laughs> like a hassle-free clothes. People want uh, waiving contingencies, which I don't recommend. I think it's I think it's a little risky with an existing home if you're waiving home inspections or things like that. But we are seeing a lot of as-is sales, and that yeah, is one did. way to make it attractive. Well, that's where it gets a little tricky because the average amount of time that a home is on, uh, on the market is about 21 days and it keeps going down. And so you've also got the fact that most homes are selling in under a month. So it used to be that you would have that sort of eight to 12 week period where you would shop for homes. Now you kind of have to go in. If it, if it meets your criteria, you have to make an offer within 24 to 48 hours. You don't really have a chance to decide uh, People I've talked to have talked about like touring a house and having to make the decision sort of as soon as they, they leave the house. It's, it's very, very stressful. Well, you still need to physically be somewhere, but metaverse real estate <laughs> is going up uh, really quickly. It's, it's amazing. There's a land grab going on over there too. So there's not really much relief in the metaverse, unfortunately. Well, we're halfway through and we come back, we'll take a look at the other half of some great segments for the week. You're going to want to stay tuned right here. Beer and Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you over 50? Would you like to get up to 33% more income in retirement? Then call now for this free book, Annuity Do's and Don'ts for Baby Boomers. This free book reveals little known secrets about annuity strategies that will help you make the right choices before buying an annuity. Call right now for your free book. And as a bonus, we'll also throw in a free annuity rate report, both absolutely free for calling Annuity General today. Call 800-504-8194. Welcome back. Well, the Supreme Court weighed in on the Northwestern University 403B case, and it's already having an impact on other cases. We discuss what fiduciaries need to be thinking about in terms of their retirement plans. 
Let's take a look. The case had the opportunity to be monumental in the ERISA space. Uh, had the defense won, uh, the case would have you know, stood for the proposition that if you're a planned fiduciary and you've got a really big lineup, then you know what? If a couple of the options are imprudent, not a big deal. Allegedly, um, allegedly imprudent, Kevin. <laughs> well, I think even if a couple of them were imprudent, you wouldn't get past the motion to dismiss because you have enough prudent options. Um, so I think the decision is not a big shock. Um, essentially, what the Supreme Court said is if your primary defense is that you've got a lot of options and that 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 provides a defense against having a couple that may be imprudent, that, you know, that by itself isn't enough to get by a motion to dismiss. Um, so what's happening with the case? It's going to go back to the Seventh Circuit to evaluate other arguments. Um, and that's where, you know, the case becomes a whole lot more nuanced and you really need to kind of dig into the weeds more. Um, and really, in the, the last paragraph of the decision, the Supreme Court talks about, you know, what the Seventh Circuit is supposed to think about when reevaluating the motion to dismiss. And it highlights the idea that, you know, at the motion, motion to dismiss stage in the ERISA context, uh, courts are supposed to try to separate the meritless goats from the sheep. Uh, and that comes from a prior ERISA case. So the idea is, you know, take a closer look at the circumstances that the fiduciaries were under. Um, look at the trade-offs they were making in terms of whether a product had higher fees versus other features. Um, and, you know, take a, a, a somewhat, you know, deeper dive than one would in a motion to dismiss in other contexts. So, you know, that's the big case. Um, it's going to come down. The, the impact of this, a lot of this is going to turn on what the Seventh Circuit does and how other courts interpret it. Uh, on its face, it's a win for the plaintiffs, but there's a lot of commentary that ultimately could be helpful for uh, defendants, even though it would have been a much bigger defense win if just having a lot of options was by itself a, uh, a, a bar to the plaintiff's bar. Sure, absolutely, Jeff. And, and there's a couple pieces. Uh, first of all, I think I'll pick up where Kevin ended. You have to see, number one, you have to wait and see. How does the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals hand, handle this? And also, how do other courts handle this? I think the Im initial message is there could be some good for defense. The plaintiffs will claim it as a win, so we know that. But if you're in a committee meeting, one of the things that, that immediately comes to mind is, well, what's happened so far? If I was at, in a committee meeting today, we've had a couple decisions that have cited the case already and yeah. sort of said, we cannot dismiss your claim on, claims on a motion to dismiss. It's highly fact-specific. So I would say to any committee, does it mean that it is more likely you're going to survive a motion to dismiss? Unless you were using the argument as Kevin so well described it as, we have a wide range of investment options, and therefore, if one is if one isn't as good, it's not the it, 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 it's not so bad. Unless you're using that argument, I think the world hasn't changed that much. It's just that the courts are citing this case already to say that. So let's see what the Seventh Circuit says. Number two, what's the takeaway? The takeaway on, on this process is yes, litigation is a whack-a-mole game. Number one. Number two, in terms of your process. You, you need to look at each fund. For the Supreme Court has said, it's just like they said in Tibble, not set it and forget it. You need to look at each fund and say, what is our basis? What, did our, what is our reasoning? And if you look at most committees, they don't sit there and say, here, we approve a slate. They don't usually do a slate approval. Maybe they approve a slate when they're transitioning record keepers, but even then they walk through and there's analytics on each fund. So I say, let's take a look at our process. Are we documenting the why of why we've chosen or maintained all these different funds at this point and make sure that we have a process where we're flagging and most advisors or consultants do where they say this one is underperforming or a management change or a merger or something like that and go through and say why this or that. The key is you don't always have to be reevaluating every single one every single time, but it's about a process to show how you decided what to reevaluate, why you didn't just sort of say the big pool was good enough and move on. That to me is the takeaway. And again, as we've talked about on the podcast, Jeff, there's other decisions out there. For instance, there was the Intel decision. And before everybody says that's about alternatives, Judge Coe actually had some really great language in there about, well, what's your benchmark and, and what should you look to? And I like to bring that up here because it's really important saying, how are you benchmarking in your reports if you're going to make that argument? So you can learn from other litigation about how to improve your process. So I think you weave it into a tapestry and go from there. No, I, I would say that it, each committee operates in a different way. There's different levels of delegation inside committees. Also, you're relying on 
you know, your prudent process relies on experts. So maybe there is more detailed reporting in some cases. Maybe there's more oral discussion in others. I don't think this necessitates an eight hour meeting. It does. You could have an hour meeting. You can have an eight hour meeting. It's about what the overall process is. So to me, what, what is likely to happen is people will often talk about hot topics in some committees and say what's going on. And maybe their investments, there's some delegation and reporting up. So there's a lot of ways. I don't think it's an automatic fiduciary oversight becomes even more burdensome. Kevin, any comments on that? Well, I, and Jeff, I, I think, you know, the meeting itself is one component. And, you know, committee meetings, I think an hour is long enough for, for folks to talk to each other. I, I get tired of meetings that last more than that. But a lot of the prep goes in before the committee meeting itself, where the consultants are putting together decks or or binders that that walk through you know, a lot of the investment performance and, you know, committee members tend to be sophisticated and they can review that material in advance and then really use that time that they meet effectively and efficiently um, and, and, you know, get a lot done in a little bit of time. And we closed out the week with discussing end of life planning to avoid that hallway huddle. Let's take a look. Right. And it happens in a lot of scenarios. You know, they talk about the hallway huddle in terms of making medical decisions, end of life medical decisions. But also certainly it comes into play with funeral arrangements. And um, nobody has ever really suffered from having things planned ahead of time in any regard. Um, and unfortunately, yeah. a lot of these decisions are left until it's late and your family is struggling to have those conversations at an emotional time. Right, and um, it's really one of those things where people think my kids will know what to do. My family will know what to do. But the fact is they don't, they're not inside your head. Do you prefer to control the spending and you know, put more money toward quality of life? Do you want to move faster into a facility that can provide you greater assistance. Uh, and also, you know, obviously the financial part of funeral planning is something I can speak directly to. And still even there, families just don't know what someone would have wanted. Sure, so uh, your advanced directives, obviously people think a lot about at one point, do they want, if someone's on life support, do, do you wanna go on life support? At what point would you be taken off life support? What emergency measures would be used at the time of a medical emergency? The thing is there's a lot more that goes into an advanced directive and it's a conversation you really need to have with a medical professional. Your primary care physician can help talk to you about the nuances, not just of emergency end of life care, but also the stages along the way. What do you want to happen should certain faculties be impaired? What decisions do you want to make if your mobility becomes limited? And that can serve as a kind of decision-making chain for your family that's extremely helpful. And so they don't have to sit there, you know, several children are arguing, you know, should we move mom into assisted living? Should we move her straight to a nursing home? And what's really the best thing? And if you can be prepared in having that conversation, if you can think about that ahead of time, it really spares your family a lot of guilt that they may have unnecessarily, a lot of family tension and dynamics. And obviously the financial piece, again, you know, it comes back to that also. Absolutely. Really, you know, any preparation that you can do is going to make things much easier on your family. And, you know, again, I'm going to go back to having that conversation with a doctor. Um, and certain states actually have documents that are slightly different than an advanced directive that really involves a very detailed conversation with a doctor. But, you know, you and I, we're, we're not medical professionals and don't necessarily know how to foresee some of the things that could happen. But again, like you said, if something's at least written down and notarized, that's very important. If your doctor has it on file, if, you know, someone has it in their hand when they go to have to make medical decisions, that is their step ahead. Is really something that's much more detailed than people realize. 
a lot of people think, oh, you'll pick me up, you'll bring me back to the funeral home, have me dressed, placed in the casket, go to the cemetery. And there's truly a lot more. There's a lot more that happens behind the scenes that you may not even know about, but things like where is the service going to be held? Uh, what are the needs of your family specifically in terms of that service? What's your personality and how do you want that reflected in that service? Some people say, you know what, I really just want to make sure that it's very casual, that it has some more lighthearted things in it, that it's really a celebration, or I want something just very straightforward and traditional. Uh, who do I want officiating at the service? Do I have a connection with a clergy or some sort of celebrant or officiant? Uh, you know, do I want photos displayed? Are flowers okay or not flowers? Where do I want contributions to go? Uh, limousines and newspaper notices and death certificates. So there are really a lot more things. And then uh, how you're dressed. You know, some people have very specific requests. Uh, do you want something formal or want something casual? And your family, if you haven't had this conversation with a funeral professional ahead of time and at least gotten that information on paper. Again, even if it's not something extremely formal, then your family is, is really one step ahead going into that difficult conversation. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, somebody you think we should talk to? Well, hey, drop us a line. And don't forget, for the latest in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, and so much more, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to see our latest content? Well, check out www.broadcastretirementnetwork.com. That's our website. And our streaming partners like Amazon, Roku, Samsung, so much more. There's over 100 of them. So you can check them out no matter what device you're using. We're back again tomorrow for BRN Sunday. I'll be joined by members of the media, academia, and financial services as we analyze all the news for the week. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts, so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited and do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.